All right, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Jason Hunt. I'm a software architect with IBM. I'm focused on uh, things cloud and uh, NFV. Uh, my name is Thomas Spatzi. I work in the IBM Netcool team, especially looking at things like service assurance. I will cover it this today. And uh, I'm Toby Ford. I uh, work at at and I'm responsible for the, the architecture of our Domain 2 platform. All right, so um, what we're going to do today, if you've been to a number of the other sessions that talk about NFV, a lot of them have probably talked about, you know, core aspects, you know, things that need to be done with service chaining or Neutron or, you know, hypervisor enhancements. That's not what we're going to cover today. We're going to kind of step up a level and go to end to end, you know, across the service lifecycle, if you will. So not even just the VM lifecycle, not, you know, instantiate VM scale and tear it down, but... You know, what does it take to deliver a service sort of end-to-end -end from the first uh, thought about what that service should be to assembling it together, to assuring it, uh, et cetera. So kind of our flow here is we're going to have Toby kind of tee this up for us. Tell us what the business challenge is. Tell us what some of the, uh, the um, approaches might be to solve that. And then Thomas and I are going to tag team on that life cycle, talk about service fulfillment, service design and creation, and service assurance and techniques that we can take from both the cloud and, and the uh, telco world and bring those together um, to help deliver on NFE. Okay. Perfect, thank you. All right. So this is our challenge for today. Uh, the telcos, uh, starting with AT&T, we've decided to take on the mission of what we call NFV. This is our transformation from uh, bespoke, vertically integrated hardware to a world that is disaggregated, disaggregated hardware and software, disaggregated uh, control plane, data plane, um, running on commodity hardware, a drive toward virtualization. For us, this is all about uh, helping us to move faster, build new function more quickly, to get to co competitive cost structure, both in terms of our capital spends and our uh, operational expense spends. So this is, this is what we're trying to to make happen and make happen faster. But at the same time, we have to live within a set of expectations. So this dynamic of m wanting to move quickly and then meeting customer needs with regard to resiliency or availability, uh, efficiency, performance, their expectations of cost, uh, and then also wrapped around that is also all the rules that we have to live within. So that's our basic challenge is dealing with this, these two vectors often going against each other. This, this concept essentially is a universal problem, right? And is when we go back and rewind 25 years to when I first started uh, coding and how agile development came up, this is really how you characterize agile development is how do I iteratively evolve quickly and then at the same time over time, how do I refactor code to make it stable and more simple? This, as we've seen, uh, is a very effective way of moving quickly and meeting people's expectations and creating very large, uh, very capable, like e-commerce sites and very capable uh, video content management or distribution sites and these, these types of things. So this is a proven me mechanism to solve for this, is using agile forces to do this. And it very much is a part of OpenStack as well. And you see this with our work lately in the foundation with promoting the big tent. We want to make it uh, possible for people to innovate and innovate quickly and then have their ideas uh, front and center as they start to try things and make things happen. But then at the same time, we have to find a way to make it more uh, manageable and resilient and upgradable and these types of things. So like, how do I make OpenStack into something that is, uh, has five to six nines of resiliency, 16 nines of durability? How do I make it so I have less than a microsecond of jitter and latency? How can I transfer you know, 10, 20, 30 mega million packets per second through an x86 box? How do I actually upgrade sites, <clears throat> get out of the conundrum that we're in today of having for at and we have sites already continue to exist that are on Essex. How do we bring them all up to a current version and even go beyond that to CI, CD? And then how do we get to something that, that actually is secure? So that's, that's the problem that we have to solve both for telcos and for OpenStack. And we, I think that this is 
very much about three things. Uh, how do we solve this? We solve it with, with in my view, <coughs> Agile, as I described already. And then also this new concept that's come to the forefront, making things cloud native. If you've heard me talk before, I've talked about the pets and midget cattle kind of uh, dynamic, trying to convince applications that were built in the legacy world to be uh, something that's less scale up and vertically scaled to something that's more scale out. Uh, so these are two two concepts, and then there's a third one that somehow got missed on this slide. Where where did my <laughs> po policy go? <clears throat> so there's a third thing that is very much a telco concept. It's called policy. And policy driven is a way of thinking that the telcos have used for many, many years of taking expectations people have and then formally uh, identifying what that represents in a, and then making manifest in a system and trying to drive to those, those expectations. So these are the three general ways I think it's going to take to solve our problem. Now, diving into each one a little bit more deeply, on the, the cloud native part of it, more than just making something scale out, making something that is simpler, more modular, and uh, more easy to manage. And you see this with containers. It's, not more, it's more than just making something more efficient than virtual machines uh, using less overhead. It also represents a move towards simplicity, where you're using less, it's, it's using less packages, less overhead of, in the operating system. You're using something that's far more transparent and easy to, to see what's going on. I think that's an essential move as we add complexity, that the components be more um, easy to understand, easy to grok. Then also, nothing that we do in any of these contexts can be done manually. There's no time for manual. It has to be dynamic and autonomous. So going beyond just the simple automations that we've done in the past with scripting, and maybe in the more recent time with configuration management tools, we have to then get to the next level, which is closing the loop in our parlance, is making the system autonomous so that it can be left to its own device to solve and resolve problems. And the last but not least is, is really a commitment toward API-driven uh, integration and um, modularity so that I can allow for innovation to happen and that for what I call eat our own baby. So make something that's solid and, and works well and such, but then realize that maybe somebody could come up with a more efficient and optimal way of doing something. And even though I've spent my life's work making this thing, that I'm able to let it go and let it be replaced by something more capable. So I think cloud native has a number of different aspects, and you see this with our... Uh, Cloud Native cloud, uh, Compute f uh, Foundation group, we're trying to promote this. And for me, I'm trying to promote these concepts with the VNF vendors who have just basically gotten over the hurdle of trying to be virtualized. Now we're trying to get them over an another hurdle to even go the next step. The last piece is the policy-driven part for me is, um, and this is one I've been struggling with because it represents bringing a lot of the, the cruft of the old OSS, BSS systems of telcos, bringing it forward into the modern world. How do we bring policy, which in my past experience has been very overwrought and complicated, how do I make it simple and incorporate it into a more cloud-native microservices way of thinking? And so hopefully uh, Jason and Thomas can solve that problem for us here. So essentially, policy is about writing down all of our expectations, making it very clear and logical. This is, uh, I want to maintain this level of availability. I want to have this person can only access this resource. Uh, this company can only do these things. Um, uh, this, I have to maintain this level of, of latency and jitter in the system. How do I specify that in rules and then put it into the system, into the autonomous system, and let it maintain those rules and manage any conflicts. 
So yeah, this is the third part of what I think is essential to make to solve our problem. Thanks, Toby. So you know, as Toby mentioned, we got this conflict here with these two arrows coming together. It's the same thing: service agility on the one side. We got to roll these services out faster. If you remember at the keynote yesterday, he talked about taking service uh, design time from 18 months to six months. You know. So you've got that on the one side. On the other side, you have the operational trust. So you remember that big picture of the network operations center? I mean, that's serious stuff, right? I mean, those guys uh, are very serious about making sure their services are up and running, because if they're not, people can die. Or if you're in the United States, your American Idol votes might not go through, which is a very bad thing. Um, so you know, how do you bring those two together? This is the same problem in the sort of software world that you know, you've had with DevOps, right? Dev on the left side, ops on the right side, you bring them together. This is sort of the same thing you know, on steroids a little bit, um, because uh, particularly on the operations side. So if we overlay on top of this, this will sort of set up the rest of the presentation. You've got you know, um, this sort of life cycle that I talked about, starting with the service design and creation. How do you come up with that service? How do you take the functions that you get from the various vendors in whatever form they might be, put them together into a service? The fulfillment piece, which is how we make that realized in the cloud when a customer orders a service, uh, and then assuring that it's going to perform as expected uh, within all those constraints. So I'm actually going to start with service fulfillment, because I think that's the one that relates most to you know, what folks might be familiar with uh, on the OpenStack side. And first uh, thing to sort of bring up here is that we're going to be in what we call a hybrid world for a while. right? Um, physical network functions aren't going anywhere. Uh, you know, the business case has to be there to go to virtual. So what you'll see initially is new services on virtual network functions. You'll see services that are growing, you know, cap sort of their physical piece and grow the new things in virtual. But, you know, for quite a while, you'll have both physical and virtual uh, in a hybrid environment. And so what that means is, you know, if your order systems and your BSS OSS, they're going to have to talk to both sides. They're going to have to talk to those existing provisioning and activation systems. And then on the right side, they'll have to talk to you know, your, your virtual aspects of it. Now, in this stack here, we used sort of the NFV terminology of NFV orchestrators, VNF managers, the VIMs, um, which those of you who have been on the Etsy side are familiar with. I do want to make the point, though, that these network services are going to not just be network functions. They're going to have IT uh, characteristics or applications with them. There'll be mobile apps, there'll be portals, there'll be APIs that they have to call out to. So this stack, you know, if you're more of a cloud software type person, don't get scared off by this terminology. You, know, you need application management, you need orchestration uh, on top of that. Now off to the side here are some of the artifacts that you need to make that um, thing become real, right? So at the very base level, you're going to need images. You're going to need containers if that's the route you go down. Uh, you're going to need the software components of it. You're going to have to assemble that together in templates or patterns as the next layer up uh, so that you can take those different network functions, piece them together. Uh, and then you know, you've got to chain those together. They've got to, one has to be able to talk to the other to the other. Um, so you've got that as the next layer up. And then when you bring that into a network service, there's sort of an end-to-end -end flow or workflow that might be needed. Uh, to make that fulfillment happen. Now, the other challenge around uh, service fulfillment is you know, not just sort of getting through that stack, but placing those network functions in the right place, you know, whether it's within a region or across regions. And I know Toby's uh, particularly passionate about this topic, so I'll let him uh, kind of lay out the challenges. Yeah, so, so placement is... Uh, one of the things that I think OpenStack has been pretty good at, at setting up a scheduler that looked at uh, some of the resources that you've put, uh, where do you put it? The challenge for us has been, okay, taking OpenStack and making it something that works across a distributed setup. So that's one dimension of what we want to see um, evolve. But then the other dimension of it is that placement isn't just one time. It's not the first time. Uh, it's something, even though we're trying to get to disposable uh, microservices architecture where I could spin up new things and use the spinning up of new things to solve for placement, I do want to actually optimize things that are running. And I don't want to, to maybe end your call so that I can do bin packing. So in the end, I want to be able to, uh, to also, over its life cycle, change the placement and uh, move things around behind the scenes without people knowing about it. All right, so that's sort of the service fulfillment side. Now let's stop, uh, step back and say, what does it take to, to make this whole thing real um, and to create it in the first place? Now, you know, when I've talked to somebody 
in, in a telco in the early days of NFV, he, he joked that when a, a network vendor would come in, pitch their latest product to him, he'd say, well, does it come on a USB key? All right? I mean, this was the whole challenge, right? Because you're moving from hardware to software, so if your network function doesn't come on a USB key, I don't want to talk to you. And I thought, well, what's on the USB key, right? You know, you expect, okay, I'm going to get their, their core software. Maybe I'll get some scripts that help automate the installation and configuration of it. Um, you know, if you're lucky, maybe you'll get something like this. This is a heat template. I've got a couple of slide shots here out of a demonstration that we do around an end-to-end -end, uh, service lifecycle. So this is a, a virtual evolved packet core and the heat template for that. So maybe they'll provide a heat template that says, these are all the VMs and the types of networks that have to come together to make my, um, to make my network function. But, you know, as I mentioned before, you'll kind of need a workflow layer above that, both to talk to the physical things and the virtual sides, uh, as well as within the telco uh, area, there's always a number of other systems that you have to talk to beyond just getting your infrastructure spun up. Um, so it's great, you know, now we've got IP address management, you know, in Neutron, so that might take one of these steps out of this flow. But you've still got inventory systems or security systems to talk to or, uh, you know, uh, the subscriber management systems, whatever, and you know, having some sort of workflow capability on top of all of this uh, is going to be necessary. And in this example, we had things like virtual probes that also got spun up and virtual testers along with it. And all this ends up being something that an end user can, can order along the way, so you might need some assets for that. In the end, you know, what I kind of was covering, that the core capabilities here, these core assets from the image up to the pattern, up to the workflow, but in order to deliver on a lot of those requirements that Toby was talking about, you know, the five nines and uh, the policy-driven pieces and, and the low latency, you're going to need a lot of other kind of assets around the edges, and that's what we show around the edges here. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of them. You know, on the testing side, uh, you know, telcos are very diligent about, you know, testing their functions before they go out. Uh, in the market. And so for, for those of us from the software or cloud side, this is a little challenging because these aren't just REST API calls, right? I mean, you've got very specialized protocols, you've got specialized testing components, and you have to treat those testers and the simulators on the back end just the same way that you treat the network function. They need to be virtualized as well. They need to be spun up dynamically in your test environments. Uh, even when you roll them out into production, you might spin up a tester and test that thing in production at the same time. And when you're testing them, you need to capture the metrics as to how that thing performs. So you need to know, you know, maybe initially, how does, how does this function perform on a, on a VM um, by itself? What happens if, if I put other network functions on those VMs? Do we start getting contention or whatever? You want to capture that set of metrics so that when we get to service assurance, that Thomas is going to talk about, you know, the service assurance systems know what's sort of expected or not expected uh, for that particular function. So you've got all these artifacts. These are all the things that have to come together to make a network service. How do you manage you know, the creation of those? So you've got all these people that are maybe using different tools to create these sort of things. And I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but the general gist is if you have a software development lifecycle today and you do sort of continuous delivery of your software components, you can use that to do uh, uh, NFV as well. A couple things you know, that would be unique. You know, I talked about different test tools, so you, your test management is going to be able to need to call out to different test tools. You're going to have a few more artifacts along the way, and you're going to have a degree of rigor around the certification environments and the pre-production you know, pre labs and all of that uh, to get that done. And then at the end, when, when all of this goes out to production, you know, you've got a couple challenges, because we're dealing with services, right? It's not just like an application that you just go and you know, I'll continuously update it. You might have a number of instances of that service for different tenants or different customers. So you might need to do sort of blue-green, you know, zero downtime deployments for that, um, you know, if it's designed in a cloud-native fashion, as Toby talked about. Uh, and for, uh, you know, new customers that come in, you've got to take all of the things that you've learned, if you will, in this design and test process and put it out into your system. So your service assurance systems have the right you know, thresholds set, your orchestration systems have all of these assets ready to be provisioned or fulfilled when the orders come in. All right, so you've heard enough from me. Let's hear from Thomas a little bit uh, around how we're going to make these things perform uh, in, in the real world. Yeah, last but not least, service assurance. And, and in my opinion, this is an aspect that is sometimes a little bit neglected, so everyone thinks about how I uh, 
stand up those virtual network functions and uh, how I scale them, but in order to decide when you have to scale or to, to see when something's wrong, you, you, you have to have service assurance in place. Um, when, when we come to this new world of virtual network functions or, or cloud in general, um, we talk about the uh, problem of two-speed IT. So we have um, the classical world, so the hardware that you, that you put in place, and this is a pretty, well, it, it's a static environment. So this is what's called the, the heavy goods lane here. And uh, we have uh, little changes in, in that layer. The volume is not that big. Um, in terms of uh, variety, we see um, events, we see SNMP um, uh, traps, uh, EMS uh, bulk imports, and uh, in terms of velocity, um, we typically do periodic batch discovery, uh, which can run sometimes for a couple of hours. So it's, it's pretty heavy, and, and, and but pretty static, and the higher we get in the stack, we, we call it on that picture, we call it a fast lane. The uh, system is much more dynamic, so we have high change rates. And things that worked in the old world don't work uh, in the new world. So for example, we can't do uh, long-running discoveries because at the time the discovery ends, the system might look completely uh, different. So what we do instead of discovery is just capturing all, all kinds of observations um, from, from this dynamic environment that out of those observations, um, we construct our view of the world so that we know how, how the system looked like uh, at any point in time. And in terms of volume, we are talking much, about much higher volumes, so gigabytes or terabytes over time, because this is a, a constantly running process. And uh, here we have to apply big data technologies. Um, talking about service assurance architecture, so what we had so far, uh, I, I tried to summarize in this picture. So both from a, from a tools perspective, a data perspective, and, and also an organizational perspective, we had, we had those silos, silos. So we had a team managing the network, we had a team managing the servers, we had a team managing applications, we had event management uh, in, in different tools. And, uh, and, and not only did we have a separation between the disciplines, but also layers. So I, I talked about the lower level network layer than your infrastructure, the applications. And another thing was that the, the, the old service assurance architectures were built for mostly static systems. So we, we had things in place to cope with the high change rates in, uh, in virtual network functions or cloud. And what we are working on now is, uh, so. In, in my opinion, the, the, the main component of this is bringing the data together. So instead of having separated data uh, stores for network, IT, applications, or for events or metrics, uh, we are applying big data technologies to basically get an end-to-end -end view uh, across all components of the system. So we, we have application information, the underlying uh, virtual infrastructure, and also the hardware, because I, I think when you, when you want to drill down into a problem that you have at the virtual layer, you have to understand where this thing is running, because uh, just provisioning a new VM or a new container might not be the solution to your problem if you have a, a problem really low down in your, in, your, in your hardware infrastructure. And hardware will be around for quite some time, I think, <laughs> uh, probably forever. And um, what we are also doing, we, we converge from the silos to a more, much more integrated stack where all the, uh, the disciplines have access to the very same data and they can also uh, pull new, put new information in, uh, in this shared data. In terms of getting data from the environment, we still have traditional discovery. So for your pretty static environment, you can still do discovery. Uh, you don't have anyone running into your data center and plugging in or uh, removing servers. Uh, every hour, so discovery is st still good here. But what's what's more important for the higher layers is those those observations. Uh, so observation can be anything. It can be data from agents. It can be flow data, NetFlow, SFlow adapters uh, that we're using here, or it can be the the, the virtual probes and virtual tester uh, information that, that Jason talked about. And all this information is just uh, posted to a to a REST API, and then uh, in real time basically correlated with the data that you have already and then all the components have access to that to that overall data via, via data broker. 
Uh, another thing is we, we have those managers, so we have the, the WIM, the VNF manager, the NFV orchestrators, and they also provide useful information. When we know what we are deploying, so we, have, we, we do deployment based on templates, so we don't have to discover everything because we basically know what, what we deployed and we have a good seat at least for doing uh, for, for, for correlating data and finding out what belongs to virtual network function or what belongs to the end-to-end -end, uh, service. So what we do is either using plugins for, for knowing, for example, when heat has deployed a stack, so heat uh, has, a, has a plugin, a plug point where you can basically get information on lifecycle events of the stack, or we can also apply uh, adapters that use the REST APIs of the, of the managers to pull out instance information or information about changes. And finally, now that we have this new architecture and we have the service fulfillment piece with the managers, uh, we, we have to close the loop for having uh, what we call closed loop control. And I think an important point is that you, you need this end-to-end -end service orchestration that talks to all the disciplines. So as part of uh, deploying your network functions, you're not only pushing down uh, instructions for, well, for deploying a, a heat stack or for creating virtual resources, but you also push down uh, hooks of your service assurance system so that agents, for example, can, can post information to that system for each instance. Um, in the same way, for each instance that you deploy, you, you push down assurance rules and policies for correlating events of, of that specific instance. And, uh, and uh, at the end, you also put policies in the middle to uh, basically tie back uh, insights that you gain in service assurance to the service fulfillment piece to, make, to, to reach this, this autonomic behavior that uh, Toby was talking about. And I, I think if you look at OpenStack, you have auto-scaling capabilities. You, in Heat, there's a new project called Zenlin that allows auto-scaling. But um, what you get out of the box is scaling based on infrastructure metrics. But is, is it really a problem when you have high CPU load? Is it really a problem when you have high memory consumptions? In many cases, yes. But what you also have to do is pull in the information from your virtual probes to see, well, is, is video streaming really bad or do I have uh, bad response times on my web applications? And so the decision cannot be made by, by, the, by the virtual infrastructure managers or the VNF managers in some cases. So what you can do is you, you, you gain this insight on the right-hand side and then you basically do not use the out-of-the-box auto-scaling um, metrics, but you, you basically invoke a webhooks based on the information you have from your assurance system. And uh, so that's um, it from my side. I think we're just about ready for questions. They did ask that you line up at the microphone if you have any questions. But just for food for thought, while people are thinking about any questions they have, I want to go back to, to this diagram. Uh, because, you know, as I've been here this week, uh, trying to understand, you know, which projects, which OpenStack projects, how could OpenStack help with some of these components that are necessary there. And I'll posit, you know, something, and you guys can agree or disagree, is that, you know, in the core projects, you know, we're sort of agreed on, you know, what, what should do what, and, and you're seeing a lot of the uh, NFE requirements starting to be addressed in there, you know, a lot of the enhancements in Neutron, for example, and probably Heat, you know, uh, you know, as Thomas said, there's some things that need to be adapted to it, but, you know, probably everybody agrees that's a, a good start for the patterns and templates. But if you look at all these other things, that's where you start to get into projects that maybe have less adoption at this point and some overlap. So, for example, workflow. Mistral is the workflow engine, right? Uh, Manasco has some workflow uh, in it as well. And then there's uh, Tacker, which is going to be an NFE orchestrator. I imagine it's going to need workflow pieces as well. So. You know, as you go around here, you could probably, you know, find OpenStack projects that have pieces of, of what's required here, overlaps. You know, those are some things uh, I think we need to work out. Uh, any questions? Yes. Between Heat and the orchestrator? Uh, do you want to, as the Heat uh, so reviewer, do you want to? So we have different levels of orchestration. I think for, for the VNF manager, for example, heat is a, is a perfect fit because in this, uh, on this layer you can apply a lot of uh, pattern-based orchestration. And I mean, uh, Jason showed this screenshot of a, of a heat template for virtual EPC. So, so that is the place where heat plays a role. But there's also a layer on top of heat. So for, for 
chaining several net network functions or for talking to your to your service assurance system at this layer you can apply uh, workflow technology and in our solution we, we currently use our business process management system for doing this Yeah, I don't know if you want to talk Tasca because I know t Thomas is involved in Tasca as well. So, yeah, I I mean we we I've, I'm also involved in the Tosca standardization, and we have a working group that uh, uh, deals especially with uh, virtual network function uh, with a VNF profile for Tosca, and Tosca includes more than what what Heat understands. So what what you do uh, or what you can do is use the well a complete Tosca package and then extract things that can be understood and processed by heat, uh, push it onto heat, but you uh, push uh, other elements like policies to another component in OpenStack. That, that is a possible way to go. And I think the other thing about Tasca too is, you know, you got to be able to bundle all these things up together and deliver them. So Tasca has this concept of a cloud service archive file, cloud service, network service. You know, maybe this is a, you know, a good way to bundle these artifacts up. Yeah, but, but to be honest, uh, I, I think there are multiple alternatives. So I, I mean, a, a, as you correctly said, he does, does some uh, level of orchestration but you, you need something on top. You can, I mean, you can also use heat template composition, have a, have a high level template that invokes lower level templates. That is a way to do it. Uh, you can use workflow orchestration or you can do this, this kind of translation of some higher level construct into pieces that you put into different uh, components. All right, thank you for coming up to the microphone. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, so my question is, uh, a lot of this stuff is still being standardized in places like Etsy, you know, ITF, etc. Separation of responsibilities has not been well defined. Uh, so trying to implement this in OpenStack, right, separating into different projects, deciding which project is responsible for what, especially in the orchestration area, right? Orchestration versus SDN controller versus uh, VNF manager, who does what and talks to where, I, we don't know yet. So is it too early for OpenStack to start addressing it or uh, should we just create de facto standard just because it's already implemented? That's never too early for OpenStack <laughs> to, uh, to take on a new project. So um, that's my big tent joke for this week. Uh, you know, I, I think you're bringing up a very valid point. Is this, uh, this issue of uh, for me, the, I'll take it a little different direction. I mean, authorization, keeping things bounded for who does what. Um, this is the question, the, the policy question that I have is, can that be done as an overlay with the heats and the attackers of the world? Or are we gonna have to go back and actually <laughs> relook at some of the integral assumptions within a, a Nova and a, a Keystone or a Glance and, and maybe rethink how that happens? So I think that is, I think in general, you're going to see projects like Tacker tactically deal with the problem you're talking about or Congress, but then, and we want to see that happen. But then eventually we're going to have to, again, as I mentioned earlier, go back and maybe have to refactor something mm -hmm. and to make it actually work. Yeah, I, I, I also think it's not too early to start something in OpenStack. I, I mean, we have Project Tacker, it's, they, they start implementing something, it won't probably be the, the best solution at the beginning, but it has to change. But I, I think waiting for a standard to finalize is not the right thing. I, I, I think you just have to try out things. So that's an experience that I made since I joined the OpenStack activities about two and a half years ago and, and learn and feedback to the standards world and, and iterate on it. So I, I think it's, it's not the final solution that we will get <laughs> today on the next cycle, but we, we just have to get started and implement something. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey guys, um, kind of to elaborate on that, right now 
um, the tools are picked to do this. Every vendor is kind of doing it themselves. Like before we kind of standardized on heat, people were using different things like Chef and Puppet, and then we all moved to heat. But there's like a list of recommended tools that you were saying, you know, if we were to look at it right now, these are the tools that you should go for, but let us know why these won't work. So we don't have one vendor off trying to figure it out one way and another vendor trying to figure it off another way. And ultimately, one of them, you know, m many of them will succeed. But yeah, in I mean, your I environment, this, not this, is, uh, this is the, the balance that we have to find. And this is, also goes back to Big Ten is, okay, do we have, do we open up the aperture, have a VNF manager per VNF? That's probably not the ideal setup. You want to have some commonality, eventually get to, to one thing. Um, so that's one part of it. But at the same time, you want to have uh, open, open the field up for more innovation. And I think, in many ways, allowing for the chefs, the puppets, the ansibles to evolve, you know, let the best tool win in the end, you know. And then also it goes back to what I was saying about uh, eat your own babies, like realize that there, there may be somebody that shows up that, that threads the needle and solves this problem in a better way, and then you need to be ready to replace whatever it was that you, you spent right. your last five years working. I mean, I kind of worry that many people are going to solve it in a fairly decent way, but it's going to be different. Absolutely. And then you're going to align on one that the other guys don't like or something. So th maybe having, maybe it's OPNFE pushing to say, you know, these are the things that we would recommend, but if you find something better, let us know and we'll put it into the well, recommendation. Well, I think in the OPNFE thing, this is, uh, we've struggled with this in, this, in OPNFE to, to find this balance between picking and then letting it open. And I think the end, end answer is back to the, to the uh, relying on that agile methods, is if we set up the right testing framework, and the same with Tempest, set up the right temp testing framework around your, the thing you're trying to solve for, then you can rely on that to provide uh, does it work or not. And then you can have a lot of variation inside. You know, and then within OPNFV, we're allowing for multiple deployment tools, multiple SDNs, multiple combinations, because we realize it's too hard to pick. Uh, what is way more important is that the requirements and the specs are clear and that the tests are complete. And that somebody rigorously uh, makes things keep flowing. Thank you so much for the pa uh, to the panel for this really insightful conversation. Uh, my question is about uh, the vision that you guys are driving about like 100 gigabits uh, per second on a commodity hardware, uh, say doing by uh, stock Neutron or like basically custom Neutron or something like that. Uh, if you were to take a playbook a page from a, a playbook from high frequency trading, they shaved off a lot of the customized the kernel lot. They made it really lean and achieve that performance. But do you expect OpenStack community to work on uh, making the neutron so lean that we can achieve this goal while still uh, it remaining relevant for the mainstream OpenStack community? I hear Anchor is he's laughing at me on the <laughs> subject. Uh, yes. I mean, this is a, a big challenge for us right now because the expectation from uh, the people inside telcos and in VNF vendors is that uh, an x86 is going to infinitely scale to be able to do hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of packets per second and such. Uh, this is really the integral problem we have to solve for. We just have to live with the fact that right now it's going to be pretty hard to get, make an x86 box, uh, a Linux kernel, go from 10 gigs to 25 gigs to 100 gigs. Right. The, there's a limit. And so w how have we solved this before? we solved it with scaling methods, scale out methods, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's, that's what I always lean back on. And it also, I think it uh, goes somewhat to, to what Thomas is talking about to bring it back, is about visibility and having end-to-end -end visibility into how performance is achieved. Um, in the environments that we work on, if you look at uh, just a, a KVM environment where you have VertIO and you have VHostNet or you have all the components of Neutron and, working to orchestrate it, right. you, it's getting more and more complicated. Uh, the people that were managing networks, they're like, I never touched a Linux box <laughs> before. What is this? Um, what is this mess? Uh, so, but giving people visibility into how, what is going on and where there's uh, blockages or bottlenecks in a nice, easy way is the challenge I have for the, for the community, is making something that allows us to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then it's easier to solve. Thank you. Great.
I think we're up on time. Thank you guys for taking part of your morning with us. And if you liked it, fill out the uh, feedback on the app. If you didn't, you can come talk to us. Uh, thanks. <laughs>